Dear viewers, um, it's me, Nabai again, and I'm with my co-host, um, Skana Johannes. And again, thank you, Bits uh, ILS, for joining us in the discussion about TPLF and EPLF relationships since TPLF's inception. And we'll be doing part two right now. And I'll have Ms. Gana ask you the first question. Thank you, Nabai. Uh, thank you once again, Mr. Elias, for continuing this um, interview with us today. Uh, we, as we described, the relationship between the EPLF and the TPLF was at its lowest points uh, beginning in 1983. Uh, can we expand and describe the relationship between uh, these two organizations uh, between 1983 and 1988? Yes, uh, <clears throat> that's uh, an important phase of that uh, relationship. As we pointed out, uh, Ms. Ghana and Nabai in the first part, the relationship faced a lot of ups and downs. Uh, it was not smooth at all throughout uh, the past uh, decades. Huh? The EPLF tried to tolerate uh, the initial uh, infantile tantrums of the TPLF, the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front. Uh, the view of the Eritrean People's Liberation Front was that it would eventually outgrow this uh, infantile tendencies and mature, rich maturity, uh, political maturity, that is. Huh? However, uh, on the Tigray People's Liberation Front side, uh, the, the clique uh, that captured the leadership, the, the, it was an opportunistic uh, type of uh, relationship. Uh, they viewed it from the tactical perspective to strengthen themselves. And like you said, in that period, 1983, uh, they withdrew from, from Sahel area, uh, from the front lines uh, that they fought alongside the EPLF in the sixth offensive. The reason, as we said, for their withdrawal was some of the security intelligence uh, apparatuses of the neighboring countries had promised them more support if they broke off relationship with the EPLF. Uh, these uh, were Sudanese and Saudis uh, security intelligence forces. The other was also the TPLF hoped that in the long uh, protracted war with, with the Derg, both sides, both the EPLF and the Ethiopian military junta regime of Mengistu Haile Mariam would be weakened, and thus it would emerge as stronger, having preserved itself, not, not uh, engaging in battle in the long protracted war, and eventually cease, fire, uh, cease power. This was a very opportunistic uh, uh, move on their side. To to provide political cover for this, of course, they uh, by this time, they said, they launched uh, a new organization within the TPLF, which they called the Marxist-Leninist League of Tigray. Uh, in this uh, organization, their projection was that they were the uh, pure advocating for the pure communist line, uh, the, the Stalinist uh, line of Albania. Uh, at that time, it was uh, the leader was Enver Hoxha. So the Hoxhaist line is uh, what they, they, they follow, uh, they, they claimed. Uh, and of course, they condemned uh, Soviet social imperialism and they condemned the, the Eritrean People's Liberation Front as a bourgeois organization, not democratic enough for them. Uh, they claim that since the EPLF does not condemn Soviet social imperialism loudly, uh, therefore it's not a progressive uh, Marxist-Leninist organization. Uh, the other point of contention that they raised was that 
the military strategy that the EPLF is following, they claim, was defeatist. I mean, it was uh, it is a wrong strategy uh, following uh, trench warfare, conventional warfare on fixed front lines uh, would, uh, would uh, lead to defeat, they claim. Uh, instead, uh, according to them, uh, the correct military strategy to follow would be uh, people's war, uh, guerrilla uh, warfare. Uh, so these were some of the, the points of difference that, that they claimed. But uh, the EPLF at that time uh, did not want to enter into polemical arguments uh, with them, uh, with, the, with the Tigrayans. It viewed this as very silly, was very childish and immature. The most urgent task was, of course, to, to weaken the Derg's military might through protracted uh, warfare alongside the front lines and fixed uh, conventional warfare. But at the same time, the EPLF pursued a guerrilla tactic also, people's war, uh, behind the enemy lines in the highlands of Eritrea where the enemy, the Ethiopian uh, military controlled uh, large territory. It would conduct hit and run uh, guerrilla tactics. So it was a combination of conventional and guerrilla tactics that the EPLF followed. Uh, this was suited to, to the territory and to uh, the balance of forces at that time. And events, of course, later proved that it was the EPLF strategy that, that uh, was correct. Huh? But as I pointed out, the EPLF, the Eritreans, did not want to, uh, to enter into a tit of tat debate with, with the TPLF. This was, in the view of the Eritreans, the EPLF, fruitless. Uh, they, did, uh, they did not have time for such silliness. In fact, the, the EPLF at one point issued a terse statement, very short. Which in English translated, that's, that uh, brief statement would be, we have remained silent and uh, kept a dignified silence not because we don't have anything to say, but because we do not want to waste our time on uh, silly uh, polemics. And the rank and file of EPLF fighters uh, understood the, this position, this political position, and the mass, the broad mass of the Eritrean people also were disappointed from the TPLF, but they completely ignored it. The mass organizations in the Sudan, in uh, the Middle East, in Europe, in North America, uh, completely disdained this infantile position of the TPLF. The TPLF called uh, seminars and uh, lectures for Eritreans, but not many people would attend this, uh, these lectures and seminars. And if the few that attended would continue to challenge uh, the TPLF, uh, on political grounds. Uh, for example, one point many Eritreans challenged them on was, you are claiming to be, you know, uh, a Marxist-Leninist uh, party, but where is the working class in Tigray? Tigray does not possess working class. Well, this is true. Uh, there, there is no, at that time, there was no industry to speak of in Tigray. There was no working class. From the ideological uh, left Marxist perspective, uh, you need a broad working class to lead, uh, you know, to be the vanguard of the party. Uh, you can say, of course, uh, the alliance of the workers and peasants, but where are the workers? In Tigray, there were no workers to speak of. Uh, there was no industrial base. Uh, Tigray was uh, at that time a backward uh, feudal agrarian society. Uh, in Eritrea, there was uh, 
a huge working class, uh, industrial base was there. Uh, also, in the rest of Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa, for example, there was some semblance of working class. But, uh, in Tigray, there was no working class to speak of. So to speak at that time of, uh, of such uh, a party was infantile. It was, uh, and more, it was also opportunistic because the vast majority of the TPLF fighters were peasants. They did not understand this uh, this. <laughs> Uh, you know, left infantile uh, political disorder of uh, the TPLF, the Tigrayan leadership. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, when the relationship with the EPLF was cut off, uh, many Tigrayan combatants who had good will towards the EPLF and who had respect the EPLF's uh, tenacity, its discipline, and its, uh, uh, you know, its military prowess, uh, were continuously asking why, why the break off of, of this relationship? To whose benefit is it? This is not to our benefit. And eventually, many started to abandon the, the organization, the TPLF, and uh, move to Sudan. Uh, so uh, this is one point. The other also is that at I, this point, yes, yes. I thought I would ask uh, in between here before we move on. Um, the relation with the TPLF, they are uh, having this daydream in their head about uh, being um, or creating this ideology of uh, Marxist Leninist uh, thing and trying their way out. Uh, was it uh, in alignment with the Abai Tigray Helmi thing? Was was there any uh, comparison to both uh, these uh, manifestos or what we could uh, call ideologies? It had some, some relationship through because uh, in order to justify their secessionist ambitions, uh, they at, at this time were saying we are the pure uh, Leninist, Stalinist line we're following uh, that advocates for the right of nations and nationalities, including and up to secession. Huh? Uh, so it, one, it was a tactical move to justify this, their secessionist ambitions of uh, establishing the independent Republic of Tigray, the greater Tigray uh, dream. Uh, secondly, they thought that uh, they would get rid of some uh, troublesome people within their ranks that they considered uh, not progressive enough. Mm, at this time, they expelled the former chair, uh, Aregawi Berhe, and his uh, colleague Gidei Zeratian from, from the TPLF. So they left and uh, went to Sudan and from there to Europe, these two gentlemen. Incidentally, uh, Dr. Aregawi Berhe later uh, studied uh, for his PhD in Europe and wrote a book uh, whose title... Uh, uh, I cannot recall right now, but uh, it was published in 2014, giving a detailed account of this, uh, this issue that we are, we are talking about. Huh? Uh, both of them have also written papers in English in various publications uh, exposing this uh, opportunistic move of the TPLF to establish this uh, Marxist-Leninist League of Tigray. Huh? So, one was to, uh, as I said, to give ideological cover for their secession aspirations. Uh, two, to expel some unwanted elements from within their, uh, the, the clique of the leadership, troublesome in their opinion, that, uh, uh, that were continuously arguing against this line. Uh, the third was of also in their view, to find some upper hand to, in their uh, 
in their uh, relationship with the EPLF. Remember, uh, the inferiority complex of uh, the TPLF click towards the EPLF uh, could be perhaps explained by the Oedipus complex. Uh, the, the psychologists such as Freud, uh, you know, uh, explain the Oedipus complex is uh, ancient Greek mythology of this Oedipus king who, who uh, slays his father, the king, and uh, uh, marries his mother. Huh? It's, it's a known uh, Greek uh, mythology and drama. Huh? And so Freud has this uh, Oedipus complex uh, in his psycho psychoanalysis uh, um, that, that he brings forward. Huh? So a uh, type of Oedipus complex in the TPLF click to uh, in their view, looking at the EPLF as the dominant father figure. Uh, and so there's always this thing of uh, upmanship, uh, wanting to, to be more Marxist, more radical, more progressive than the EPLF. So they came up then with this. Uh, they thought that since the EPLF loudly is not uh, uh, issuing uh, a position vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union as in their view, social imperialism, uh, they thought they could, uh, you know, outshine the, the TPLF in left progressive circles in the West or uh, elsewhere. Eh? Uh, remember, uh, uh, by way of a footnote, the EPLF had already passed this stage. I mean, this was not the first time that the issue of Soviet social imperialism was raised in, in the Eritre Eritrean political arena. Uh, in 1978, a group that was affiliated with the EPLF, a support group of Eritrean progressive student uh, organization in North America called the EFLNA, Eritreans for Liberation in North America, in its Tigrinya acronym, more known by ENASA, Eritrean Nenats Metaps in America, had, already, had also raised this issue uh, when the EPLF decided to, to take the, the strategic withdrawal uh, position, to withdraw from uh, the liberated territories and to, to retreat to its mountain stronghold of Sahel. Uh, the EFLNA at that time, again, left, uh, took a left extremist position and condemned the strategic withdrawal. They, in their view, they, they said, this is treasonous. The, the EPLF leadership is betraying the revolution. Uh, the EPLF uh, also is not taking the stand in condemning the Soviet uh, intervention forcefully as social imperialism and so on and so forth. This went nowhere. In fact, it led towards the disintegration of that, the group, the EFLNA in North America. And it took a long time to reconstitute, reorganize the, the, the broad-based mass organization in North America. So... The EPLF had been through that. I mean, uh, the reason it, it did not take that position was uh, EPLF said, we are not a, a Marxist party. We are not, uh, we don't want to enter into that kind of, uh, of uh, political position, which others have taken uh, in the West. And it, uh, it had this fragmented many uh, left movements. Huh? So, we condemn forcefully the Soviet intervention, the Soviet Union and its allies in the Eritrean struggle on the side of the dirt. We condemn it forcefully. Uh, we will struggle against it, but we will not take that, uh, that position of uh, whether the Soviet Union is an enemy or not, whether it's social imperialism, what kind of nature, uh, political ideology it's following now. Uh, uh, the EPLF wisely chose to avoid that issue. Uh, wisely because uh, in, it, in its view, correctly, it's a national liberation movement. Its uh, mandate is to liberate Eritrea and not to enter into ideological debates uh, beyond its mandate and scope. And by so doing, in fact, it it saved its political ammunition towards uh, fruitful uh, engagement, 
exposing the derg uh, as as a, a, a narrow ex, uh, opportunistic group uh, that is not socialist at all, uh, that is confusing uh, the rest of the world. It's a purely a military junta whose base is in the army, in the military, who, which didn't have a mass popular base in the Ethiopian uh, population, be it workers, peasants, or the, the middle class. Uh, right. The Derg's position was narrow. So this was the position that uh, the EPLF took. Great. So um, as you've mentioned, uh, due to this uh, uh, reasons that you've mentioned uh, earlier, uh, the relationship between EPLF and TPLF was uh, at its lowest point. Uh, till 1988. What has changed? What has changed in 1998? Mm -hmm. Two things. I think uh, the EPLF uh, having taken the correct decision of strategic withdrawal by the time of the seventh offensive uh, when we say offensive, these are large-scale military campaigns that the Derg regime undertook to, to wipe off uh, the Eritreans from the Eritrean field. So by the time of the seventh offensive in 1983, uh, the balance began to tilt, the balance of forces. Huh? Uh, the Eritrean side, the EPLF, from a position of weakness, slowly and slowly, it reached uh, parity and uh, what is called stalemate was reached. So from this stalemate, the EPLF then exploited uh, the conditions and undertook attacks further from its base. The base area was in, in Sahel, so further towards the Gash Barka, it liberated the town of Tessane and captured strategic weaponry uh, and, uh, you know, tanks and what have you. So further strengthening itself. This was in the beginning of 1984. And then it shifted uh, rapidly uh, and attacked the, one of the Derg's main military commands on the northeastern Sahel front, what the Derg called the Wukau is, the Wukau command. Huh? So uh, in a very daring uh, attack, combination of uh, mechanized and infantry. It cleared the coastal areas from Mahmimet, Auget, all the way to, you know, uh, almost near, near towards Masawa. So vast territory was liberated. That, uh, that command was demolished. Here, uh, for example, uh, the second commander of that front, the Ethiopian uh, Colonel uh, Girma Tesema was captured. Uh, another one, uh, a pilot uh, by the name of uh, Zab Petros, if I'm not mistaken, was also uh, uh, MiG pilot whose MiG was shot down, was also captured. Thousands, thousands of uh, Ethiopian soldiers were taken as prisoners of war. So the balance tilted rapidly in favor of the EPLF. This was the beginning of 1984. And then from there, of course, operations behind the enemy lines, the guerrilla uh, hit and run, uh, small scale uh, attacks were very successful, tipping the balance further in favor of the Eritreans. In 1985, the, the EPLF also further uh, ventured into the enemy stronghold and the town of Barantu liberated it, captured it for a while. But then uh, when the Derg side undertook a counter-offensive, it retreated from Barantu and uh, foiled the eighth offensive at that time, the final uh, offensive, large-scale offensive on the side of the Derg. So this was how 1985 ended. Huh? On the political front, the EPLF also uh, gained more uh, attention and uh, media attention from the rest of the, the outside world, especially in the West. 
remember, before that time, the world had almost given up on Eritrean struggle. Huh? They said, oh, this is, uh, that's it. The, the Eritreans cannot withstand this huge uh, offensive of the dirt. But events, especially after the sixth Red Star offensive, proved that the Eritreans are still there. They are continuing the war, the fight. In fact, they are gaining the upper hand. So the world public attention uh, began to shift. Huh? So more support was forthcoming from, for the EPLF. And the issue uh, reached a point that uh, uh, even within the Derg, uh, within its military, there, was, there were rumblings. Uh, the generals began to, at, that, at this time to say, there is no military solution to this Eritrean problem. There has to be political solution. This forced the Derg then to enter into talks with the EPLF. These talks were uh, not publicized. They were uh, unofficial. Uh, they, they were not officially publicized, but uh, there were meetings, about 10 of them, in this period between the EPLF representatives and the Derg representatives, mostly in Europe, in Italy. Uh, I think one time in Greece, uh, 10 or so secret meetings were, were conducted. Uh, of course, these were exploratory, going nowhere. But as I said, the EPLF tipped the balance. Its uh, strategy of uh, strategic withdrawal proved to be correct. Its military strategy uh, proved to be correct, proved the TPLF wrong. And the TPLF, uh, uh, by, by this time, the TPLF's position was uh, for all to see. It was not engaging in any meaningful military uh, you know, battles with the DER. As I said, within its rank and file, there was demoralization. Uh, many abandoned it and left for the Sudan. So uh, as things began to go downhill for the TPLF, for the EPLF, it was uh, the opposite. So by 1987, the EPLF was confident enough to hold its second and unity Congress in, in liberated Eritrea. So it assessed the 10 year period from 1977, the first Congress up to 1987 and drew a political program and strategy for the next phase. It, uh, it concluded that the, the stalemate now is over and now the EPLF is, has seized the upper hand and is on the offensive. So as soon as the 1987 Second Congress was over, the EPLF undertook uh, large-scale military operations behind the enemy lines, such as in Areza, uh, in the highlands of Eritrea and the Sarai region, mm, uh, also uh, on the Na'fa front. An offensive was uh, undertaken by the Eritrean People's Liberation Army, which was successful. Then came 1988, the beginning of the downfall of the Derg. What happened in 1988, March? A huge surprise attack by the EPLF, well prepared, well studied. Uh, on many fronts along the, the NAFA front, the NADO is the so called NADO command, uh, was undertaken. This was a blitzkrieg, and within uh, two, three days, that vast uh, front line was completely demolished, and the EPLF captured strategic weaponry, many tanks, uh, heavy artillery. Uh, such as for the first time the BM-21, so-called Stalin organ. And uh, this was a surprise to, to all, uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, I remember at that time I was in the liberated area of uh, Sahel. Huh? I went there along with my comrades as part of the delegation to attend the, the uh, Second Congress of the National Union of Eritrean Workers. Huh? So uh, after the Congress of the Workers, I remained behind for some 
political uh, courses. After the, the end of that course, uh, this, uh, this victory of Af'abad, the Nado, his command was, uh, uh, you know, was accomplished. And at that time, I remember uh, the great uh, British uh, African historian, Basil Davidson, was, happened to be visiting the liberated areas of Eritrea. And so from there, he conducted an interview with the BBC uh, to tell them about what he has seen, he has witnessed about this victory of uh, NADO command. The BBC reporter was puzzled. Where are you calling from? He asked him. He told him, I am in, inside Eritrea in the Sahel Mountains. How are you calling? <laughs> well, at that time, the EPLF had already uh, obtained some satellite phones. Uh, so in communication, it was, uh, you know, able to, con to establish contacts with the outside world, not only with satellite telephones, fax, and uh, uh, telex, and so, and so on and so forth. So uh, let's take a listen to that uh, interview because it, it is revealing of, uh, of the great victory and the significance of Af'abad. The interview, incidentally, was conducted. The interviewer is uh, the late uh, and great uh, Ambassador Girma Asmorong, who passed away a few years back, unfortunately. His last posting was as uh, Eritrea's ambassador to the United Nations. But at that time, he was uh, part of the EPLF uh, uh, fighters in the Department of Information and News. And he's the one asking Basil Davidson the questions. So Basil Davidson was, was there, and as you said, he compared uh, the defeat of the Ethiopian forces uh, in Afabad uh, to the Dien Bien Phu in Vietnam, where uh, the French uh, built a fortress. They thought it was not. Uh, I mean, it, it was not uh, attackable, mm -hmm. but the uh, Vietnamese forces, uh, with their leader uh, General uh, Jap, uh, they attacked, and the French were uh, stuck there. And after 57 days, the French gave up, mm -hmm. and they were ready to to withdraw and to sign a peace agreement. In history, this is known as the, the, the turning, turning point. And uh, when Basil Davidson uh, compared uh, Af'abad uh, to Dien Bien Phu, this means that it was a historic event, especially for us Eritreans, because it was a major victory, a major achievement after a long period uh, uh, between the uh, strategic withdrawal and uh, the Afabat event. It was the, 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 the most important uh, victory by the EPLF. Uh, Mr. Basil Davidson, it's a pleasure to have you here in uh, our liberated Eritrea. It's uh, great of you to come here. Thank you very much. Well, um, how long have you been in Eritrea and which places did you visit? I've been in Eritrea, in free Eritrea, in liberated Eritrea for about 16 days. And I have visited uh, many in sort of the civilian departments of the um, EPLF, including those concerned with education, and those concerned with agriculture, those concerned with medical care. Uh, I have talked to the people on numerous occasions about the structures of the daily life, the political life which you are introducing, the con concept of participation. Uh, I have also been here, I must say by accident, I didn't know it was going to happen at the moment of your great offensive, and so I have been able to um, hear a good deal about that and to witness, if uh, at a distance, some of the great achievements, great military achievements, which you have scored here in Eritrea in the last three or four days. Uh, of all the things you saw and places you visited in Eritrea, what impressed you most? Well, many things, but I think that generally 
I was impressed by the way in which you have made a strength out of your environment. The environment here, you live in rocky hills, you live in uh, places without uh, much apparent water, little vegetation, but you have managed to make a strength out of all that. That's one thing. The other thing I, feel I found uh, at such places as the Revolution School and um, at such villages as Adshek, I found a great sense of community, a sense of companionship, a sense of mutual solidarity in suffering, yes, but also in the struggle against uh, the Ethiopian occupation and all its consequences. Uh, you have written a lot uh, uh, about uh, national liberation movements in Africa and also about Africa and you have had a uh, direct experience uh, in almost, uh, I could say, national liberation movements in Africa like Guinea-Bissau, Angola, Cape Verde, Mozambique, I mean Algeria. How do you assess uh, the Eritrean national struggle vis-à-vis -vis this uh, national mm. liberation movement? Well, I think it brings me to my third point that strikes me, of course, and that is the uh, relatively very advanced a technological and organizational level which you have achieved. In these respects, it seems to me that this is certainly by far the most advanced, the most advanced, the most uh, intellectually the best equipped of all the liberation movements that I have known in Africa over the past 30 years and more. Uh, possibly it might be argued that the Viet Minh and then the Viet Cong uh, were at your level. I wasn't there, so I don't know. But so far as Africa is concerned, I have no doubt that the uh, experience of the EPLF historically uh, will be in the center of the picture of the whole story of the struggles against the colonial systems. A lot of uh, reporters and visitors talk about uh, the efficiency and organizational solidarity and solidness, I mean, rather, of the EPLF. What's your uh, observation of this fact? Yes, it seems to me to be at a very high level, both in terms of organizational capacity and also in terms of uh, community solidarity. That seems to be certainly to be the case. I have no doubt about that at all. It must be said that other liberation movements also achieved a uh, great sense of, of solidarity. They couldn't have survived without it. Um, so I think you share that with all the others, even if yours is um, quite remarkably advanced. Um, I think that the other thing that strikes me very much about your movement, your front, is, uh, so far as I've been able to talk to your leaders, and that is quite far, how practical and how sensible your political approach is to the really great problems which are, exist in this region of the continent. But the achievements of the EPLF and its effort uh, to ascertain equality of women. What is your uh, observation of this, uh, the role of women mm, in Africa? Uh, yes, well, I, I can't speak of that in detail, but obviously the, the, the women fighters and the women organizational the personnel that I have seen and met, whether at one level or another, are very impressive and there of course you are far ahead of any other liberation movement there has ever been with the possible exception of the Viet Minh. Uh, nothing in Africa can even, could even, has ever been able to compete with the degree in which you've been able to break through the traditional um, male superiority domination machismo which uh, has been very common, is still very common throughout this continent and indeed not only in this continent. Uh, how do you assess the strengths uh, and the military power of the EPLF? Well, I can't make any judgment about that, um, but I simply go on the event, on the uh, evidence of the last few days. Uh, the last few days have proved that the EPLF is a highly superior force, both in terms of morale, in terms of tactical efficiency, because this clearly was a great encirclement maneuver. I, of course, I don't know the details, but it clearly was. And in terms of morale, I said that, but also in terms of capacity to use modern weapons. I, you have captured some uh, extraordinary weapons in the past, and I have seen in use or in position uh, heavy artillery, which you've taken from the enemy, uh, tanks in plenty, now you'll have, I'm sure, plenty more, which you've taken from the enemy, 
And this is a level which no other liberation wants in movement in this part of the world, in the Western Hemisphere, let alone Africa, has ever been able to achieve. Nothing like that has existed in Latin, any part of Latin America, and nothing like it until now has existed in Africa. So I have no doubt at all that you will, you will triumph in this struggle, and I hope that this triumph can come soon, so that the sufferings may be shortened. How, what did you feel when uh, you heard uh, the news, the liberation of Africa, that you were present, uh, to you were, uh, I would say, we were lucky enough yes, to have you here when we these historic achievements by our Eritrean People's Liberation Army was achieved, uh, and uh, how did you receive the news? How was it, you know, at that particular moment? I was, uh, I was very, very pleased, and not simply because uh, it is the victory of those whom I regard as my friends, but because the only way in which the war, this war will be ended is by your victory. There is no other means of handling this situation. So the more victories you can score, and the bigger they are, the better, uh, uh, better all of us who, who are better, I, I and all my friends will be pleased. So we felt great, I felt great joy, and I'm quite certain that all my friends back, in, back at home similarly felt great joy, not because of the suffering and the dead and all the rest of it, all that is very tragic and all that is very deplorable, but it wasn't you who invited the war after all, it wasn't you who uh, asked the Ethiopians to annex your country, it wasn't you who uh, wished to be a colony. So clearly the blame lies with those who've not been able to solve the problem and the blame therefore lies very squarely with, with the Derg, whether this Derg or the one before it, or Haile Selassie before here. Uh, 3,000 years, mm. but you as a prominent historian, a uh, man of authority on African history, what's uh, your uh, opinion on this Ethiopian claim on Eritrea? Well, the claim is utterly worthless, utterly worthless. It has no historical significance at all. It is a legend which they like to believe. Uh, they like to say that they are the, the, the inheritors of the empire of Aksum. The Empire of Aksum ended in the 8th or 9th century AD. All right, even if we accept, which I do not, that they are the inheritors of the Empire of Aksum, let us remember, this is a long time ago, and the French, in 1066, invaded my country and conquered it. Are we therefore now to say that England is part of France? Nobody is going to believe that. It is as foolish as that. It is a silly myth. Um, do you envisage, as you, a man of experience about national liberation movement, the emergence of uh, independent territory yes, in I, the Horn of Africa? I believe it has, has already emerged. I, I have been living in it for two weeks. <laughs> and uh, this will continue. And this remarkable military success which you've scored over those whom we have to call the o Ethiopian occupying forces, that's the only way in which you can define them in my judgment, uh, this confirms it, this confirms it. The circumstances, of course, I don't know, but it will happen, yes. Uh, do you have any message to convey to the people of the world, in particular to the African people pertaining uh, the Eritrean cause? Yes, I do. Insofar as I have any influence in uh, amongst those who listen to me, especially perhaps those in my own country and I hope those in Africa, it is past time that the world took notice of the realities of in the Horn of Africa. And the realities are, one, that Eritrea is not and has not been and certainly will not be a province of the Eth Ethiopian Empire State. That the EPLF, the uh, national fighters of Eritrea, these are not rebels. These are nationalists fighting for a nationalist cause, just as all the other nationalist causes we have seen in the past 30 years have been. This is an anti-colonial struggle at base, there's no doubt at all about that. The Africa should wake up to this. Africa should open its eyes to what is happening. The major powers should, should realize that the only way in which peace will come is by a just settlement here, and a just settlement cannot be in favor of this Mengistu Derg or any other Derg like it. There has to be a democratization of the Ethiopian Empire State, such as was promised way back in 1974 when Haile Selassie was removed from the throne. This democratization 
did not come about and we know what's happened. It isn't only that uh, there is conflict here in Eritrea, but uh, you know as well as I do there is conflict in a dozen other places. These conflicts cannot be resolved by force. They can only be resolved by democratization of the Ethiopian Empire State, and that means one, the recognition of the right of the Eritrean people to independence, whatever they decide to do with that, their right, and two, the recognition of the centrality, the centrality of the nationality conflicts inside Ethiopia proper, inside traditional Ethiopia, not including Eritrea, needless to say. And uh, also, we must say, with the neighboring states, I think of Somalia, there is an extremely difficult conflict concerning the Ogaden that has to be resolved in a friendly way. There may be one with the Sudan, I don't know. But whatever the peripheral conflicts are, they must be resolved. And this is a two-point program which the world must recognize is the only road to peace. And I think it is shameful, I think it is shameful that the OAU so far has not lifted a finger to recognize the, the realities of the situation here. And I can only hope that these victories, which you have now proved your existence, proved your worth, and proved your future, will bring the world to understand this, and will bring the OAU to confront this problem squarely at last. Uh, would you like to convey a message or make a statement to the Eritrean people? Well, I don't feel important enough to do that. Um, uh, I did the first message because I spent my life studying Africa. I only would say to the Eritrean people, uh, congratulations, your cause is just. Accept the situation and continue to win. Continue to win and please as rapidly as you can. Thank you. Thank you for coming to our liberated area, uh, Mr. Basil Davidson. Thank you for the interview. If you have uh, some more things to add, please feel free to, to do so. and. Uh, Thank you again. Thank you so much. I feel very free and liberated myself in free Eritrea. And at the moment, I don't have anything more to say, but no doubt in the future I shall. Thank, Thank you. So from there, um, the relationship between TPLF and EPLF, uh, can we say uh, it came back to normal? It is surprising how fast uh, things changed because as I said, I was in Sahel at that time, inside liberated areas uh, of Eritrea. So uh, Basil Davidson compared this victory that the EPLF scored on the Afabet uh, Nado front, uh, in his words, as you have heard him, as the greatest victory scored by a national liberation movement since Dien Bien Phu, uh, the Vietnamese scored Dien Bien Phu's victory in 1954, he said. So some people think that uh, Davidson was comparing the victory of uh, Nado as equivalent to Dien Bien Phu. No, no, that's not what David. Uh, David Sen is saying. What he's saying is the greatest military victory scored by a national liberation movement after the Mbemfu. But in terms of scope, the two are incomparable because uh, in the Mbemfu, the, the battle uh, it was extended for several months and uh, the forces of the French were vastly outnumbered by that of the Vietnamese, the northern Vietnamese. Huh? In, in Nado, uh, the, the Ethiopian army, of course, had huge, uh, huge contingency. I mean, the numbers were incomparable. But 
uh, the whole operation lasted uh, not more than three days. Within three days, it was over. So this was, uh, I think, the greatest uh, military victory scored in the annals of national liberation movement, you can say. Mm -hmm. So uh, at that time, I also remember listening to Dimsi Wayane, the TPLF radio station from Tigray. Remember at that time they had established their own radio station. So congratulatory messages were uh, being broadcast uh, every hour by the TPLF, congratulating the heroic EPLA. And uh, this is a historic victory, congratulating the Eritrean people, the Eritrean uh, leadership. And soon they also uh, requested a meeting with, with the Eritrean leadership, the EPLF. So a meeting was held between uh, representatives of the EPLF's leadership and the TPLF in Sudan. Uh, essentially, the EPLF took the moral high ground, uh, the moral political high ground and said, let us not dwell on what transpired in the past. We will not be acrimonious. We will not be pointing finger, the, the finger of blame. Huh? Instead, let us take the recent past as a learning experience and as, let us focus and uh, look forward. Huh? Now, let us uh, uh, commit ourselves to renewing a joint uh, operation together, military, political cooperation, and uh, undertake the final phase to, to remove the Dirk from power. Could, so, we, uh, could we dig deep a little bit on the part when they met up again and uh, they decided to have this meeting in Sudan, like you said? Uh, could you specify which year it was, how it went, who were the people involved uh, at that time? Yes, uh, this was uh, soon after the victory of NADO. So the EPLA's victory at NADO was uh, March 18, 1988, I think. So by April, the end of April or beginning of May uh, is when uh, the meeting took place in Sudan. Uh, I, I could be off maybe by, by a few weeks, uh, a couple of weeks. Uh, it may have been also uh, towards the end of May, but it was not uh, long after the, the victory of, of Abed. So we're, we're talking about May 1988, uh, not, not late than that. Uh, as to who were involved, uh, I think from the TPLF side, uh, Meles Zenawi was there, if I'm not mistaken, and others like uh, Abba Itzahaye, three or four of their top leadership. Huh? From uh, the Eritrean side, uh, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, three or four of the top uh, leadership of the Politburo uh, were there, I think. General Sabhat Efrem uh, was there. Uh, others also, maybe Ambassador Samara Rosom, uh, who was there at that time as the, uh, the chief representative of EPLF in the Sudan, uh, was there. Uh, and so uh, I'm not sure if uh, Secretary General Isaiah Savorki was there or not, but two or three of the top leadership were there. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I said uh, in this meeting, uh, the EPLF decided to let bygones be bygones. I mean, there are lessons to be learned from the, the recent acrimonious past. We will not dwell on, uh, you know, pointing the, the blame, uh, but we'll rather focus and look forward uh, to expedite the final demise of the Derg. So accordingly, joint military operations to be undertaken were agreed upon. Uh, there was a, a joint statement of both sides. Uh, uh, and so uh, by this time, I think 
the TPLF also abandoned, uh, uh, realized that the Marxist-Leninist League of Tigray thing was uh, was not going anywhere. So uh, they more or less uh, forget about it. Huh? So mm-hmm. soon after that, though, in 1989, is when uh, they decided to undertake a military operation in Tigray. Uh, the Shire operation. Uh, yeah, so, uh, if, if I may interject on that. So uh, despite uh, the negative attitude uh, of the TPLF towards EPLF in the previous um, uh, four years, uh, or the four years prior to 1988, the EPLF, as you mentioned, uh, um, tried uh, to be positive or cho- chose to be positive and look forward into achieving a, com- a common goal. So um, the, uh, the reawakening of this new relationship between EPLF and TPLF, uh, how did that contribute to, uh, to the common struggle you know, uh, of the uh, EPLF wanting the Derg regime um, to be destroyed and also TPLF wanting uh, the Derg regime to be destroyed? So, how did, how did that uh, reawakening of the relationship contribute to this uh, common uh, goal? Oh, well, it uh, contributed greatly because uh, joint operations were of strategic importance. Now, bear in mind also, there were other liberation movements inside Ethiopia, such as the OLF, the Oromo Liberation Front, with whom also the EPLF had good relationship. Huh? Uh, there were others, uh, such as the EPDM, Ethiopian People's Democratic Front uh, Movement, um, which also uh, had good relationship with uh, the EPLF, the Eritreans. Uh, this was based around the Gondar area. Uh, and so all in all, this was uh, the final uh, death toll. Uh, for the Derg regime. Uh, But before that, we forgot also to mention in the beginning of 1984, when the TPLF decided to embark on its adventuresome uh, infantile, uh, left-wing infantile disorder path, the MLLT and what have you, that was also a period of... uh, the great, the great famine in Ethiopia and Eritrea. You remember 1984 at that time, uh, the BBC broadcast uh, came up with these harrowing pictures from Koram uh, inside Ethiopia of, uh, you know, famine victims and... Uh, In Ethiopia, seven million people are threatened by starvation. Thousands have already died. The famine caused by drought is the worst in living memory, and now the rains have failed again for the third year in succession. The relief organizations are doing all they can, but there just isn't enough food to go around. One of the worst hit areas is in the north of the country, where the problem has been complicated by two secessionist wars in Eritrea and Tigray. 40,000 refugees have converged on the town of Koram in the hope of getting some food and medical aid. Our correspondent, Michael Burke, has been back to Koram after four months and he found the situation far worse. Dawn, and as the sun breaks through the piercing chill of night on the plain outside Koram, it lights up a biblical famine, now in the 20th century. This place, say workers here, is the closest thing to hell on earth. Thousands of wasted people are coming here for help. Many find only death. They flood in every day from villages hundreds of miles away, dulled by hunger, driven beyond the point of desperation. 15,000 children here now, suffering, confused, lost. Death is all around. A child or an adult dies every 20 minutes. Forum, an insignificant town, has become a place of grief. The relief agencies do what they can. 
Save the Children Fund are caring for more than 7,000 babies. Every day they weigh them on a sling, then compare their weight with their height. By this rule of thumb, one in three is severely malnourished, starved to the point of death. This morning, another 114 babies have arrived. The choice of who can be helped and who can't among the constant stream of newcomers is heartbreaking. There's not enough food for half these people. Rumours of a shipment can set off panic. As on most days, the rumours were false. For many here, there would be no food again today. Two months ago, there were 10,000 people here. Now the latest harvesters failed, there are 40,000. There's nothing like enough food in the country, not enough transport to move it if there was. These people have waited all morning. They want food, they're getting clothes. Those naked and most needy are marked by a pen stroke on their foreheads before the distribution begins. An armed guard sits on the small bundles of cast-off clothing sent from countries in Europe. A few jackets, trousers and sweaters, once worn in the wealthy West, now handed out to starving people who have to live in the open through nights when the temperature drops to little over freezing point. Today, only a tiny amount of grain is being given out to those who have brought in firewood. People scrabble in the dirt as they go for each individual grain of wheat. For some, it may be the only food they've had for a fortnight or more. The Ethiopian government tries to persuade these people to go home, but that would make death certain. Better to camp here. The money was siphoned off. We were using aid money to buy arms, you know. Uh, through secondary means, you know, if you come to the Middle East, you, you can buy arms uh, if you have the money. So we were using some of the money to buy arms. Argarwi Berhe says that at the height of the famine, 100 million dollars went through rebel hands, but only 5% went to relieve the desperate hunger. <laughs> Men like Argarwi Berhe fell out with their former comrades and now live in exile. But his story is supported by other sources, including a CIA assessment written at the time. The operation was supervised by the rebel leadership, including Meles Zanawi, the man who is today Ethiopia's prime minister. His office turned down a request for an interview. Preoccupied by the famine, no one asked how the rebel groups were holding off government offensives. Aid agencies and campaigners like Bol Geldof knew nothing of the diversion of the money. Charities deny that there was systematic misuse of the funds. Sometimes we were using aid money to buy arms, you know, uh, through secondary means, you know. If you come to the Middle East, you, you can buy arms uh, if you have the money. So we were using some of the money to buy arms. That was it. You say that uh, you were using aid money to buy arms. Can you just explain how that process worked? You know this organization called REST, Relief Society of Tigray. It was the humanitarian wing of the TPLF, and through uh, REST, aid money was coming to the TPLF. So when you get this aid money, you, you make a budget, you know, for, for, for the relief for uh, the front or to buy arms for medicine and so on and so forth. So I would say we were relying on uh, the aid money for sustaining the, the, the struggle. What sort of sums of money are we talking about? I mean, is it hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars? What, what are we talking about? Well, we are talking about millions of dollars. I can cite you a concrete example. Uh, in 1985, when Tigray was hit by uh, the terrible famine, uh, aid money was flowing to rest and through rest to the TPLF. So the MLLT and the TPLF leadership, which is w almost one and the same, uh, had uh, to budget for uh, 100 million US dollars. I remember Mullah Zainawi suggesting that 50% of uh, that money uh, should go to TPLF activities, 45% should go to MLLT organizing, and 5% to support the victims. I've spoken to some people who are involved in the aid transfer, like Max uh, Pembody. 
who actually handed some of the money over. I mean, we have a picture where you actually see him handing the money over, and he says that they were very, very careful. I mean, there you are, you see him buying 300 tons of sorghum. I know these two guys, eh? they, they, they are TPLF fighters, both of them. But one is pretending to be a merchant, the other is pretending to be buying the sorghum from the, the merchant. But both of them are TPLF senior cadres. And they're just doing, you know, a drama to pretending, uh, you know, as a merchant uh, for, for Marx, you know. So all these things are uh, dramas to, to, to get the money. That's so, so he was fooled? I would say, yes, he, he was fooled. Ethiopia Famine Aid Spent on Weapons by Martin Plough, Africa editor, BBC World Service, published on Wednesday, 3 March 2010. Multiple rebellions. The crisis in 1984 prompted a huge Western relief effort. Although millions of people were saved by the aid that poured into the country, Evidence suggests not all of the aid went to the most needy. At the time, the Ethiopian government was fighting rebellions in the northern province of Eritrea and Tigray. Each of the countryside was outside of government control, so relief agencies brought aid in from neighboring Sudan. Some was in the form of food, some as cash to buy grain from Ethiopian farmers in areas that were still in surplus. Max Peberdi, an aid worker from Christian Aid, carried nearly $500,000 in Ethiopian currency across the border in 1984. He used it to buy grain from merchants and believes that none of the aid was diverted. It's 25 years since this happened, and in the 25 years, it is the first time anybody has claimed such a thing, he says. He insists that, to the best of his knowledge, the food went to feed the starving. But the merchant, M Mr. Peverdy, dealt with in that transaction claims he was in fact a senior member of the Tigray People's Liberation Front, TPLF. I was given clothes to make me look like a Muslim merchant. This was a trick for the NGOs, says Mr. Gabramatin Araya, underneath the sacks of of grain he sold, he says, were sacks filled with sand. He says he handed over the money he received to the TPLF leaders, including Meles Senawi, the man who went on to become Ethiopia's prime minister in 1991. But Mr. Gabriel version of events is supported by the TPLF's former commander, Aregao Berhe. Now living in exile in the Netherlands, he says the rebels put on what he describes as a drama to get the money. The aid workers were fooled, he says. He says that some hundred million dollars went through the hands of the TPLF and affiliated groups. Mm. Some 95% of it was allocated to buying weapons and building up a hardline Marxist political party within the rebel movement. But Mr. Aragawi and Mr. Gebremedhin fell out with the TPLF leadership and fled the country. Uh, the TPLF at a time when t the, the, the famine was very severe in Tigray, by the way, yeah? Uh, the, the, the most devastated part of Ethiopia was Tigray. So at a time when uh, hundreds of thousands of Tigrayan peasants were uh, you know, suffering from famine, uh, huge uh, loss of life, the TPLF decided to embark on this uh, political nonsense uh, of left-wing infantile disorder. Uh, and this is what... Um, by the way, uh, Aragawi Berhe mentions in the BBC uh, report of 2010. Uh, remember in 2010, uh, this uh, British, I mean, journalist, Martin Plout, uh, come up with an expose for the BBC about how TPLF used famine aid, uh, abused famine aid. Huh? Uh, his informants from the TPLF side were two uh, main actors, 
one, Dr. Aragawi Berhe, who was the former chair, as we mentioned earlier, expelled because of differences uh, within the TPLF uh, leadership clique. The second one was uh, one by the name of Gubermetin Araya, who this time is, I think, uh, living in Australia, but uh, who at that time in the 1980s was a TPLF fighter in charge of uh, economic uh, affairs. So in this BBC report, uh, they tell that reporter that uh, the TPLF uh, used uh, an approach towards the relief, Western relief organizations, convincing them that instead of sending grain to Tigray uh, through the hard road from Sudan, uh, relief food, I mean food aid, uh, there is bumper harvest in some parts of Tigray, mainly what they called Western Tigray at that time, the, the Welkait, the Gede area. So we can buy, uh, you know, this grain from the farmers and distributed ourselves to the famine victims in Eastern Tigray. Uh, this, uh, the TPLF managed to convince the Western aid agencies, the humanitarian NGOs, so-called. And so, uh, it, you know, they, they filled up sacks with sand uh, and put the, the sand-filled sacks on a truck, loaded them on a truck. The top part would be grain, but the bottom, the, the bulk of it, 90% is sun. So the, essentially they were selling them sun. And this way they gained, uh, they, they profiteered from, from food aid because they were getting cash for, for, for uh, grains. And Aragauber estimates that uh, nearly uh, 100 million do US dollars were obtained this way in cash, which strengthened the, the TPLF as an organization. And for uh, this amount, the TPLF then used to strengthen the new organization called MLLT and to buy uh, weaponry. This is abuse of food aid. This, this is so. What we see the TPLF doing now, abusing food aid to feed its army, is not new with the TPLF. <laughs> it is a long established tradition going back to almost uh, uh, 35 years, to 1984-85 period. We will put uh, a link to, to that article uh, for our viewers. I mean, this is a BBC report. So I'm not... I'm not making this claim. One of the top, former top leadership of the TPLF, Dr. Aragawi Berhe himself exposed this, uh, this scandal. Uh, were the Western aid agencies, the relief humanitarian agencies aware of this? Uh, some say, no, they were not aware of it. But I'm convinced that some were very much aware of it. And they, they looked, they gave it a blind eye. Uh, and in this way, the TPLF uh, strengthened itself. It amassed huge wealth, abused the food aid. Uh, only a few amount of the food aid trickled toward the hungry uh, famine victims, uh, peasants of Tigray. Uh, the vast you know, the, the bulk of, of uh, the food aid uh, in cash was used by the TPLF to strengthen itself uh, politically and militarily. This is one. Uh, the second thing I would like to mention here also, uh, you may have heard uh, accusations by the TPLF made that uh, at a time of uh, dire need, uh, very bad, famine period, the EPLF closed its borders and uh, uh, for, uh, blocked food aid from coming to Tigray through, through Eritrea. This is an accusation that the TPLF has been repeating for years. And that the Eritrean side uh, 
has not addressed fully. I mean, uh, it needs to be addressed because it's, uh, it creates uh, a sense of, of uh, a feeling of hate, uh, this, this wrong information, this lies that the TPLF disseminates, uh, a bad feeling, negative feeling among Tigrayans. The facts are to the contrary. The EPLF did not initially block access, uh, transportation access to the TPLF. Uh, remember, the, TP, uh, the TPLF had a base area in uh, the, the body map plains, the surroundings. Huh? And the only way uh, transport route for the TPLF was through the Gash Barka to Eastern Sudan, to Girmaika. Uh, from from the Badim area to Girmaika is about uh, I don't know maybe 200 kilometers 250, uh, but there was a road transportation dirt road uh, that previously the ELF used, but the EPLF also used that uh, that area to to reach the Gashbarka Western uh, uh, Western Eritrea. So the TPLF did not have access to Sudan. Uh, at that time, uh, the only access, road access, uh, transportation access was through Eritrea. But what, what they wanted to do at this time, this uh, famine period, 84, 85, was to transport uh, a huge uh, population, the famine victims, by road uh, on, on a foot journey towards the Sudan and to bring Western cameras, TVs, to, to record this, uh, to take camera, video camera pictures of, of this drama. But essentially what he wanted to do was to create a TV drama. But what, what would happen, what happened in fact was as they, you know, as they took this, uh, you're talking about uh, tens of thousands of uh, malnourished famine victims, poor peasants of Tigray, children, women, elderly, what happens is that this would take a long journey, it would take about uh, weeks to reach to the border of Sudan. And the weak, weakened, malnourished uh, population would die along the road, huh? which is what, what happened. Would die of uh, malnutrition, dehydration, weakening, uh, and of course, cholera along the way also. Uh, the EPLF said, no, why would you do this? To create a TV drama? To, to score PR points, this is absolutely uh, cruel and scandalous. We do instead what we do, bring the food aid to the victims in their village. This is what the Eritreans did. Uh, they, the, the Eritreans, remember, had a very sophisticated relief network called Eritrean Relief Association. So from the Sudan, they would transport food aid, you know, like wheat, grains, and other essentials for the drought famine victims, and bring it all the way to, to, to the village level. So it had a very good network of distribution of, of food aid, and thus it avoided, one, the depopulation of Eritrea going to refugee camps. That, that is bad. Once, once you resettle in the refugee camps of uh, Sudan, the hopes of returning to Eritrea diminished by the year, you know, you become sort of uh, used to, to, to institutional, institutionalized to, to relief handouts in the refugee camps. And, uh, and so uh, it said, this is absolutely unacceptable to, to the TPLF. So the TPLF then uh, hastily constructed a road network through the Wolkai Tsagade area, Humara towards Sudan. And uh, in fact, uh, undertook this uh, TV drama, as, as I mentioned, with uh, uh, a huge number of famine victims and many died by the, by, by the roadside. Many fell victim unnecessarily. Uh, but that's the nature of the TPLF. The following debate, was from the Voice of America Amharic radio broadcast of March 2010. 
የህወሓት ምክር ቤት አባል የነበሩትና አሁን ለተወካዮች ምክር ቤት አባልነት አድዋ ውስጥ የሚወዳደሩ ለተወካዮች ምክር ቤት አባል We have on the line former TPLF Central Committee member and currently Arena Park member Mrs Aragash Adana who is running for parliamentary seat from Adwa and former TPLF chair Dr Aragawi Berhe to debate on Voice of America East Agaba program would you say that our previous report about TPLF's misuse of food aid funds was exaggerated yes i would say it was exaggerated what i know is that TPLF exerted great effort to resolve the famine problem in my view there was no situation whereby we allocated 5% of the relief aid to famine resolution and the rest 95% to other matters i do not remember the statistical data exactly when we finalized the budget aragash was sitting in attendance at hidmower e after the founding of the marxist leninist league of tigray malalit from the 100000 dollars that was obtained from the relief fund we allocated 50% for strengthening of malalit 45% for the tplf and only 5% for famine relief for the population Which meeting is this? The one at Wari, the Joint Central Committee meeting of the TPLF and Malalit when the budget allocation was discussed. This proposal was presented by Mele Zenawi and you were sitting right in front of him. Sorry, I'm not aware of this. Were you not present at that meeting? Am I expected to recall the budget allocation at every meeting for every year? But when such a big decision was taken, I should not be able to forget it. What Mrs. Aregash cannot evade is that the decision was taken. I raised my hand at the time and objected. I said, this relief funds came in the name of the people. And as we are witnessing, our people are dying from famine. So please, comrades, the 5% is too little. Please let us raise the allocation to a higher figure. I presented the meeting with this appeal. The answer I received was, not to worry. Once the Marxist Leninist League of Tigray is solidified and strengthened, every problem will be resolved in a scientific manner. Do you remember this, Mrs. Aragash? I do not recall that 5% was allocated for famine and that Aragawi opposed it. Okay then, tell us how much was appropriated for famine. I'm telling you that I do not recall the budgetary allocation. If it was decided as such, I should have been able to recall it. On the one hand you claim that you don't recall the budget allocation on the other hand you claim appropriate action was taken so which is it can i ask mr aragawi excuse me let me finish for one whole month we convened 500 cadres of the organization and it was a big feast and celebration just like that of the founding of the dergs workers party of ethiopia Every day we had Allah and edge drinks provided a bull slaughtered for meat and we had a jolly good time However, according to CU Mesfin's report, in the food journey of the famine victims from Tigray to Sudan, he informed the meeting that 13,000 of hungry people died on the way. In this Congress, Mrs. Aragash was not present? She was present. Yes, I was there, but we did not sit in meeting in total disregard of the people's situation. There was coordinated leadership to resolve this crisis. For sure there were some people who died along the way to Sudan. The number might be as mentioned. I have a question with your permission. If as Aragash claims there was well coordinated organization and leadership, how is it possible that 13,000 perished in that journey? If food and medicine were provided on the way and the people were assisted, how come then that 13,000 of our people died? Dr. Aragawi, I believe you know better the situation that prevailed then. Yes, it's because I know that I'm talking. Wait, wait. Those people were traveling from Raya all the way to the Sudanese border. First of all, there was no road. Even if there was a road as such, it was not possible to transport by trucks almost 200,000 people. We did not have that capacity. There was no adequate water supply to be provided. so such conditions affect the outcome excuse me please if there had been good organization there would not have been even a single death let alone 
I do not think we should present it that way to advance our political position. Regardless, there was an organized effort and leadership. How can you argue that for an organized leadership that there shouldn't be any problems, that things would be smooth 100%? This is not right. Listen, if as he claimed there had been an organized coordinated work, then there should not have been even one single person dying. But when things are unorganized, then thousands of people die. At worry, since there was an organized and coordinated founding congress of the party, everything was presented in a timely manner exactly by the clock. Food was provided on time, drinks on time, medical attention, everything was running smoothly and on time. Okay, let's wrap up this here and proceed to the next question to each one of you. At that time, when TPLF was conducting an armored struggle, what was the source of your funds to purchase food and ammunition for the war? Where was the money coming from? The guns and bullets and ammunition were obtained from fighting the Dirk and capturing them from the Dirk soldiers. Mr. Meles Dinawi also said that, quote unquote, why would we need to purchase this when we could capture them from the Dirk? is how he put it. They are lying. For sure, we used to capture weapons from the dirt, but not all that we needed came from the dirt. Take for example, mines and explosives. We could not get that from the dirt. So we used to purchase mines, RPG bombs, bazooka, mortars, and many other weaponry. So where would the money for this come from? Where else? There was no other source. We did not dig gold or have any other production for income. Our main source of finance was the famine relief funds. If there were other sources of funding, let Madame Aragash tell us. I didn't say that we never purchased ammunition and weaponry for the war. To some extent, we captured it from the Dirk's arsenal. There were also supportive governments and organizations that provided help. I thank both Mrs. Aragash and Dr. Aragawi. የህወሓት ምክር ቤት አባሌ ነበሩትና አሁን ለተወካዮች ምክር ቤት አባልነት አድዋ ውስጥ የሚወዳደሩት የአረና ትግራይ አባል ወይዘሮ አዳነሽ ይቅርታ ወይዘሮ አረጋሽ አዳነንና ዶክተር አረጋዊ በርሄን በሰጥ አገባ ፕሮግራማችን አጋጥመናቸዋል ባጀትና ወጣ ወይዘሮ አረጋሽም ቁጭ ብለዋል እዛ ህድሞ ወርኢ ውስጥ ከማለሊት ምስረታ በኋላ 100000 ዶላር መጥቶ 50% ለማለሊት ማጠናከሪያ 45 ከመጥቶ ለግንባሩ ትራዎች 5% ለህዝቡ እርዳታ እንዲሰጥ ተብሎ ተመደበ ባጀት ወጣ የትኛው ስብሰባ ነው ወርዒ ውስጥ የህወሓትና የማለሊት ጆይንት ማከላይ ስብሰባ በጀት ሲመድብ ሐሳውን ያቀርበው አቶ መለስ ነበር ፊት ለፊት ቁጭ ማልኩ ወይዘሮ አረጋሽ አስተዋሳሉ 5% ለድርቅ መስጫ የሚለውን ውሳኔ ሲወሰና አቶ አረጋዊ ደሞ ይሄንን ሲቃወሙ እኔ አላቅም እሺ እንት ነው የተመደበው ሲመደብ አላቅም ነው ምልህ ቢወሰን ኖሮ አስተውሰው ነበር የሚል እንት ናለኝ አቶ መለስ ጋር ነው ያለው ሚኒቱ ድሮ አቶ ገብሩ እጅ ነበር አሁን ማስረጃ ሊሆን አይችልም ጠቅላይ ሚኒስትር መለስ ጋር ነው ያለውና ልናገኘው ማንችልም ባንድ በኩል አሃዙን አላቀውም ይላሉ በሌላ በኩል ደሞ ተገቢ ምደባ ለድርቅ ስራዎች ውሏል ይላሉ ወይም አላቀ ተአርገውን ለጠይቆ ይቅርታ ሊቀርስ አንድ ወር ሙሉ 500 ያክል የድርጅቱ ካድሬ ትፍስበን ወርኢ ላይ سنቀመጥ ድግስ ነበር የሚደገሰው ልክ ይሰጣቆ ምስረታ አይመስል በየቀኑ ጠላ እየተጠጣ ጠጅ እየተጠመቀ በሬ እየታረደ ድግስ በድግስ ነበር የኖር ነው ባቶ ሲዩም ሪፖርት መሰረት ከትግራይ እስከ ሱዳን በነበረው ጉዞ 13000 ሰው መንገድ ላይ ሞቷል ብሎ ሪፖርት አርጓል በዚህ ጉባኤ ወይ ዘራጋሽ ማን ነበርም ያው ነበሩ ነበር ኩል ህዝቡን ጥለን ህዝቡን ጉዳይ ፍትትል ሳናረግ ስለሰባ ላይ ጉባኤ ላይ አልተቀመጥንም የተደረገ አመራር ነበርው የድርቁን ችግር ከአገር ውስጥ ወደ ሱዳን በሚሄድበት ጊዜ ህዝቡ የተዳከመበት ሁኔታ ስለነበር በጉዞ ላይ የሞቱ ሰዎች ነበሩ ከዛ በተጨማሪ በርግራፍ እንደተባለው ሊሆን ይችላል ቁጥሩ አንድ ጥያቄ ግን አለኝ ነው አጥቢሱ በድርቁ ጊዜ ለተጠቃ ህዝብ የሚረዳ ጥሩ አደረጃጀት ነበር ነው የሚሉን ያሉ ጥሩ አደረጃጀት ቆነ ለምን 
በመንገድ ላይ በጉዞ ላይ 13000 ህዝባችን ያልቃሉ መዳኒት እና ምግብ የሚቀርብለት ከሆነ የሚረዳ ከሆነ ለምን 13000 ያክል ሰው ለምን ይሞታል ዶክተር አርጋዊ ፕሪንታው ለበለጠ እንኳን አንተ መጣቀው ይመስለኛል አዎ ስለማቀው ሆኖ ነው ምናገር ቆይ ቆይ ያ ህዝብ ከራያ ሆ ጀምሮ እስከ ሱዳን ጥርስ ነው የሚጓዘው ያለው በጀመራ ነገር መንገድም ይለም መንገድም ሊኖር በጠቀላላ 200 ሺህ ህዝብ መኪና አቅሮ ማመላለስ አይቻልም አልነበረንም አቅም እንደዛ ለማድረግ ወይዘራ አረጋ ወሃ እንደል በማይገኝበት ሁኔታ ነበር ይቅርታ ያርጎልኝ ወይዘራ አረጋዎች አፌክት አርጎታል አራ ይቅርታ ያርጎልኝ ጥሩ አደረጃ ጀስ ነበርማ አንድ ሰው ማይሞትም አደረጃ ጀስ ቆው ፒካንትናችን ብለ ማደስስ ያለብን አይመስለኝ አዎ ግን ተደራጀ አመራር ድጋፍ ጻካል ነበርው ግን የተደራጀ ስራ ነበርው ሰፍሊ ነው የገባው ወይዘራ አረጋ አንተ የተደራጀ ሰው ታዲያ ሁለ 100% ችግር ለምን ያጋጥማል ተብሎ ይክር ክሪከፈታል አዎ የተደራጀ ሰው ላይ ስለምሄ ስሙ የተደራጀ አስተዋል እሱ እንደሚሉት የተደራጀ ስራ ከሆነ አንድ ሰው ሞት የለበትም ያልተደራጀ ሲሆን ግን በሽዎች ይሞታሉ ወርዑ ውስጥ የተደራጀ ፓርቲ ምስረታ ስለነበረ ሁሉም ነገር በሰዓቱ ይቀርባል ምግቡ በሰዓቱ ሐኪሙ በሰዓቱ መጠጡ ሁላው ጠጁ በሰዓቱ ይቀርብ ነበር ሽምክተዋዩ ቡድን ወይንም ህዋሃት በዛን ጊዜ ጥቅጥቅ ግል በሚያካይድበት ጊዜ ለወታደሩም ሆነ ለላ ተግባር ለቀለብ ለመሳሪያ መግዣ የሚውል ገንዘብ ምንጫቹ ምን ነበር በርግጥ ከደርግ ብዙ መሳሪያ እናገኛለን ሁሉ መሳሪያ ግን ከደርግ ይገኛል ማለት አይደለም ለምሳሌ የመኪና ፈንጅ ንውሰድ ደርግ ያለው ፈንጅ ከየት እናመጣለን ፈንጅ ምገዛ ነበር የአርፒጂ ቁምብላ ምገዛ ነበር በቀላሉ ስለማይገኝ ከደረ ምን እንደነሱ ባዙካ 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 እንበለው ወይም እንደ ሞርታር አይነት እነዚህ ሁሉ ለወታደራዊ ስራ የሚያገለግሉ ማት ዝርዝርም ይሄዳል ለመሄድ ይቻላል ይገዙ ነበር ገንዘቡ ከየት ይመጣል ገንዘውማ ሌላ ምንጭ የታለኛ አልቆፈርና አልሰራን ዋናው ምንጫችን የድርቅ ገንዘብ ነበር ወይዘሮ አረጋሽንና ዶክተር አረጋዊና መሰግናለሁ is a very opportunistic organization cruel in this regard no matter how much it claims that it cares for for the people in reality its nature uh, it is uh, ugly nature of using famine to score political points to score pr points and to enrich itself to abuse the food aid uh, was was proven uh, amply in this experience of uh, the 1984-85 period and uh, this uh, is hidden from the people of Tigray and we need to bring these facts we need to highlight it because it has been uh, you know scoring propaganda points hoodwinking the people of Tigray creating unnecessary acrimony and uh, hate uh, based on lies between the Eritrean people and Tigrayan people the truth must come uh, must come out and be revealed and that's part of uh, of uh, i think the strategy of silence that the EPLF followed in this regard uh, uh, had its downside i must say uh, comrade elas thank you so much for an in depth and lengthy um discussion on the relationship between EPLF and TPLF between 1983 and 1988. And as we end this part, uh, we look forward to uh, discussing more on the relationship uh, between EPLF and TPLF post-1988 in uh, our next part. But for now, uh, we'll be ending it here. Thank you so much. Thank you. I look forward to our next uh, discussion.